Hi, I'm Terrell Turner, the host of the Business Talk Library, and today we have another great guest on because one of the phenomenal things that we are witnessing happening across every type of business is, do you have an easier way to communicate, share, and analyze information? And a lot of times that comes of developing some type of application, some type of program. Now, a big problem about that is not everyone knows how to build a system from scratch. And so being able to find a solution where there is a platform that developers can learn and that they can create dynamic, awesome tools on is a very essential thing. So we brought on a founder of an amazing company that is really helping solve this problem across so many different industries. So you want to stay tuned to hear more about this company. So stay tuned. So without further ado, let me bring on my guest. Robert, welcome to the show. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I am great. I am great. You know, this is a topic that I've been really interested in as I've started to look at, you know, different ways uh, that companies are evolving and trying to find some low code options for providing a solution. So before we jump into the details of that, tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. Yeah. So my background, uh, I've basically been working in uh, fintech one way or another since about 2000. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was really into making video games and I've always been thinking about what it means to connect humans to data. Uh, and, you know, maybe it goes all the way back to when I would watch Star Trek and they had the, you know, as a kid and they had the screens up there and I would see them like, oh, the engine needs more thrust. And how do you know that information? And you're interacting, right? So before they were even really like, VGA screens, I was, I was thinking about what does it mean to, to allow humans to act with data. So really, this has been a lifelong passion for me. Um, so my, that's, that's my background. Uh, and then I, naturally, kids get into video games. So I got into video games, building video games, uh, and then uh, found my, my way into fintech. Uh, started off at Bear Stearns. Uh, following that, I was at JP Morgan. Um, I was the uh, head of infrastructure at the Dark Pool Liquid Net. Uh, and then after that, started 3Forge in around 2010. Gotcha. Now, I guess, you know, having a background, like I said, you experience with, you know, creating video games and going into fintech. Like when people hear your story, do they often ask, like, how'd you go from video games to fintech? Well, yeah, OK, that's that's a good story. So first off, the the uh, prior me would have would have been appalled that I went into fintech because I thought like <laughs> I thought that's where developers went to die. Like you go and you sit in a corner in a cubicle and just start writing for loops to process like regulatory reporting transactions. It's actually a fascinating industry. And uh, so so basically uh, 2000 was kind of the dot bomb era, if, if you recall. And so I was working out in L.A., uh, a few different companies out there. And then I just decided, you know, I, I want to try to find something more stable. So I started doing consulting and then I ended up at uh, ended up at Bear Stearns. And, and like I said, when I went into this, I thought I was I was going to hate it and it was going to be boring transactional stuff. And then you realize that it has all the ingredients of a really, really lifelong challenging problem, which is you have huge amounts of data that need to move very quickly. They need to move accurately. There can never be error. Everything's got to be audited. Entitlements is a huge part of it. And everything's got to be quick. Whoever can do it faster ultimately wins, you know, I mean, you know, I so so start off in regulatory reporting and then I ended up uh, on the high frequency trading side. And, and that was in the beginning, like 2005 on the HFT side. And, and for maybe the listeners who are uh, fully aware, high frequency trading really is the idea that you're letting a, uh, a very high level. Uh, is is you're letting a computer basically do the the micro trading for you. So you say I want to buy a thousand shares of Microsoft. You send it off, and then a computer is looking at the whole market, uh, and then deciding at the exact right moment which exchange that I send that to. Now you can imagine there's two computers sitting next to each other, both trying to trade a thousand shares. One's going to win. One's going to get the better price. You know what I mean? And so it gets faster and faster and faster. And so when I was starting, it was milliseconds. Now it's down to microseconds. But the same challenges are still there. Have to have 100 percent accuracy. Everything's got to be accounted for, you know, and then at the end of it, the volumes are massive. So how do you build displays around that? So, yeah. 
Gotcha. You know, and that becomes a very big thing because I think for people that aren't familiar with it, I mean, from a, if we took the technology and you really just kind of looked at it from, you know, if you didn't have the technology, someone would have to actually pick up the phone and call all those different brokers and figure out what the pricing was and then try to come back. I mean, maybe three days later, they come back with an answer and say, hey, here's what we should have done three days ago. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, what's funny. I, it, it's kind of a side story. But one of my jobs when I first got into it, because I was on the regulatory side, is I had to actually go in case everything went down. You still needed to know what time a transaction had taken place. So back in the early 2000s, they still had a box sitting on the desk where they could like punch a card and it would like go. And, and, and so something had to make sure those clocks had the right time. So that was part of my responsibility in, in, in that field. So it was interesting to see that transaction transition. I was literally coming in where they were starting to replace physical means of doing things, you know, over the phone sort of things with with electronic trading. And I've been through it the whole way. And, and you know, I, I, I call it Morse phenomena, not Morse law because I, you know, tapers off, but um, I mean, we've seen that. I mean, just every year, the amount of data doubles and doubles and doubles. Um, and, and of course it's just because everything's becoming electronic. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess from your perspective of having seen, you know, like I said, the old analog approach to now the massive amount of data and the computations that are happening, like, do you ever sit back and just like are amazed at how far things have come in that short period of time? Uh, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little from column A, a little from column B. I'm, I'm part, I'm amazed how far things have come. I'm also amazed at how uh, disorganized things are in some ways too. I think it could actually be a much more efficient system that we have, um, you know, behind the scenes, there's a lot of duplicity and things like that. Then there's a lot of room for streamlining. I mean, let's put it this way. I, I think there's still huge, huge room for competition and to, to streamline costs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it's it, it's it's hard to believe, um, you know, how far we've come in just 20 years. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Now, coming into your, you know, your life with, you know, three, four, I mean, what was it that really kind of sparked it as, hey, you know what, this is the business that I'm going to invest my time and my energy into? Right. So uh, through my my travels, so to speak, uh, in the in the different companies I was at and the different positions within those companies. And by the way, in each one of those, I had a variety of different responsibilities. Uh, I realized that there was a lot of overlap in the problem set between each of these. So whether you're in the high frequency trading side or you're in the back office side, well, not the clock setting side, that that's, that's unique, but other, <laughs> I'll put that in a separate bucket, but the other ones, you know, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of similarity yet they were being built from the ground up over and over again. And so I really looked at it as just, I felt it could be a much more efficient system. And by building a more efficient system, um, customers could have a better experience. Um, companies can save more money. You can have faster delivery times, which gives you a, a competitive edge. And so I felt that what the industry needed was a platform that wasn't siloed to solve a particular problem for a particular sector within finance, but just a general data agnostic platform. So I actually stepped outside of finance and looked at the problems at large, like what were people doing in social media? Um, what are people doing in IoT? And really thought about how, how do these problems translate? And they actually translate very, very well. But the problem is we like to think of things in a siloed fashion as, as humans. And we like to think this is my job and this is what I do. Computers don't think that way, right? Computers think zeros and ones, you give it a problem, it solves it. And so really the idea was how can I build a platform that um, can be ubiquitous, that can you know cut across these asset classes. Again, because the idea is, and, and, and to go even a little further into this, um, one other advantage I didn't mention was when you build these systems and they're siloed, um, then your whole business line becomes siloed. And I think we've all seen this interacting with different companies where you call up and you want help, but you're in this department and you need to be transferred <laughs> over to this department. And the reason is because behind the scenes, Literally, managers built the business up in that way, and maybe there was a merger and transit, or, you know, merger and acquisition, or something along those lines. But you basically had these siloed 
organizations within the large organization. And my thought is to cut across that. So that has been, that's been my life. And that's what I've been thinking about. Again, it's that Star Trek screen. You know, you come in and you see the whole <laughs> ship in one shot. <laughs> you see all the details of the whole ship in one shot. You know, and I think that that's a, a very, you know, a very amazing resource for businesses. Because I know throughout my, my career, I, I spent some time like with a couple Fortune 500 companies. I remember when I was at GE and we were going through the phase where we were buying other businesses. And, you know, it seemed exciting on the surface. And then when you got down to the systems and you realized none of these systems were ever designed to communicate. <laughs> like, this exactly. is going to be a nightmare. <laughs> Yeah, I, I say it's, you know, I say it's all fun and games until your first merger acquisition. Then then suddenly it's like, you know, it's well, no, I mean, you build, you know, you build your 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 your, your company or whatever you grow some idea and you can be very disciplined. We're going to use this technology and this technology and this technology because we're going to front end, middle, back. And that's how it's going to be. We're going to be a window shop or we're going to be a Linux shop. But then you buy another company and they just do things completely differently. Well. There, there you go. Now, now you're stuck in a world where you need our platform. <laughs> not, to, not to plug us, but yeah. No, or, or, or a platform like ours. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, I mean, but I think that does make a very really good point because, you know, my background is finance and accounting. And I think even from that standpoint, I remember sitting in conversations where we were debating, it was like, is it like, you know, operationally, it would make more sense for everybody to get on the same system. But the question is, can we afford it? Because what they were running into is they would have to build something from the ground up. And it's just like, is it worth th that effort? Or do we just build in workarounds, hire extra people to just deal with these incompatible systems? So, I mean, mm -hmm. I think you guys are on to something that is is a phenomenal solution for people. So, as you kind of, you know, build 3Forge and really introduce um, customers to it and introduced it to the market, what has the response been like? Um, it's uh, the response, I would say, in the beginning is, is unsettled. It was, it was a bit unsettling almost in a way. So, so first off, we were, we were pushing our idea at the same time as, you know, the, the concepts of the data lake um, or the data river, the data ocean, and all these different terms, you know, <laughs> while all these things are going on. And so there was a huge push from industry to say, just take all your data from all your different groups and just shove it all into one database. And, and I could go through all the problems with that. First off, different types of databases are designed for different types of data. So all along, I, we were pushing a paradigm called leave the data where it is, which is don't try to reinvent everything and say, we're going to tear it all out greenfield build everything again that's extremely expensive and it's and a lot of times it, it, it frankly it fails to try to do that what we believe is you leave the data where it is and you basically connect these systems um you connect to these systems instead um and so for us uh you know getting into kind of the journey of three forge it really has come down to honestly a few key individuals and key companies that really we're willing to take a chance on a very different approach to solving this. And they've, and they've reaped the benefits of doing that, to be honest. But yeah, that's, you know, that was the reaction. And now I would say in the last few years, now it's, it's people understand and they've seen the pain of, of what it's like to deal with all the things you were just talking about. And, you know, we're getting a lot more acceptance now. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. Cause like I said, I, I remember my days of being, you know, kind of the finance person on a system implementation. And I remember there was one at one of the companies, and I won't say the specific company's name, but we were about, you know, we were six figures into expenses on this project. And there were just some glaring things that's like, we cannot move forward on this. Like, I know we spent right. all this money, but we just cannot move forward because it wasn't going to it wasn't going to solve the problem that you were talking about, because you're still going to have all these, you know, a group of silos, you know, on mm -hmm. the surface. They look like they function together, but it's just like this system doesn't really work well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you start to, you know, you know, to work with the, the different clients and introduce them, you know, what is it like when someone, you know, someone reaches out like, Usually, what are the problem case that they have, or the use case that they have that they're saying like, "Hey, Three Forge is the perfect solution for X, Y, Z." 
Yeah, I, it's, I, you know, I wish I had a buttoned up answer to that. It's funny because every time it seems like we've, we've kind of, you know, we sit back and strategize, well, what's the angle of how we've, you know, how we've been embraced by these different companies. And we almost always end up coming in on some different trajectory, but we always end at, at the same place. Um, and so usually what it is, is there's an effort. A lot of times it's, it's regulatory and compliance driven, um, or sometimes it is uh, support desk driven. Um, and by support desk, I mean, you know, you call up one of these big banks and, and you have a large portfolio across many assets. You want to talk to a guy and you want that or, or girl and you want them to know all of your positions across all your assets. Right. And so that's an example. So really, it's been, you know, it's it's been sometimes it's been front office driving this because they want that platform. Other times it's been back office driving it because from a compliance standpoint, you want to be able to have that full picture as well. Um, and then, you know, sometimes it's just been, a, uh, you know, we come in with a small use case, but the whole idea is that we've made it very, very simple. Once you've integrated in one spot, kind of link into another system. You know I mean? We've worked very hard at building the tools to say, link to another system and so it, it just naturally starts to expand once we get a use case because every use case is tangential to another use case you know I mean, once you solve this system the people who use this system never just use this system they're always using two systems or three systems and so you start to just I expand that way yeah I, I can think of a lot of scenarios where i've called into a help desk or something and you get to the question and you well you've waited online you finally get to a human being and you ask your question and they're like, oh, that's not my department. We're going to have to transfer you. Up. <laughs> you know, it's funny because it, it's always bothered me. But I, I feel like I because I, I, I've built this product that, that solves a lot of that problem. And so I feel like I'm allowed to get a little bit extra upset when that happens to me. Like, <laughs> I've actually solved, <laughs> solved this, please. Just, just use this software. You know what I mean? It's like I've actually tried to do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, but yes, yeah, it's always happening. <laughs> now, when you're in, like, as you know, you go from, you know, this idea and, you know, you're solving, you know, a, a very serious problem. Now, on the side of managing, like I said, the business around your idea, what has that been like as far as, you know, bringing people on the team and, you know, developing in the different functions within running your business? Mm-hmm. Well, I've, I mean, in, in that regard, I've been lucky to have found, I think, a few key people that I trust to help me, um, you know, kind of set up this company also. Well, let's let's put it this way. My background is is I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a computer junkie, computer nerd. I code all day long. That's what I love to do. I love to look at architecture problems and try to solve them and think about the next big thing. Um, but, you know, when it comes to running a company, um, I have to wear a different hat. For a long time, when the company was kind of being bootstrapped and starting up, yes, I had to kind of manage and um, and work through that. Uh, and over time, you know, we found some people that I that I really trust that that helped me manage those things. I mean, recently we set up an office in London, and we well, not recently, a few years ago, last year we set up an office in Singapore. I never, I mean, that that's you know, that's that's serious logistics and things like that. So unfortunately, <laughs> I've got a good team to help me to help me do those things. Now, what was that experience like for you? I mean, when the idea came up about, hey, we're going to open an office in London, like, you know, what, what was going through your mind when that idea was pitched? Well, uh, a few things. One, I, you know, is probably just as much my customer's idea as, as mine. And one thing that's that's very interesting, at least in the capital markets, is how much. So first off, um, when you go to the UK, uh, anytime you're going to have a follow the sun, like 24 hour support system whether you're a bank or maybe even an airline or something. I don't it, Well, maybe not airlines. They, they probably put it all in India or something, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but um, no, but, you know, at least in finance, generally you want to run your support out of London because that actually touches North American hours and you also touch um, APAC hours, Asia hours. Um, so that was natural for us to set up an office in London because our tools are used to support support. And support is often in London. So that was a natural extension for us. But what's been interesting over, I don't know, maybe the last 36 months, maybe even longer, is we've seen an uptick and an uptick and an uptick in, in APAC trading um, and just what's going on in Asia. I mean, at this point, you know, we're, we're doing some uh, use cases with cryptocurrency. There's tons of cryptocurrency being uh, managed and traded through Singapore, as an example. Um, and so uh, the, I guess the, 
the, the, the, it was a long answer. The short answer would be this was driven by customer demand. Um, you know, just the amount of usage we get out of London, the amount of usage we get out of um, APEC. Yeah. Nice, nice. Now, so when it comes down to like the, the type of, you know, companies that you guys support, like when you think about kind of your target audience, like what do some of those companies look like as far as like size and nature? Um, size and nature. <laughs> uh, the, the, well, the size, I mean, you know, we started off, I'd say with the hard problem first, and that's actually how I like to look at computer science problems in general is to always tackle the hardest problem first and then work your way backwards, as opposed to, I think what a lot of people try to do, which is minimum viable product. So with that said, um, we really went after the, the largest banks, um, you know, global banks, tier one banks, we have um, several of those are our key customers um, and they help us drive the roadmap and things like that. Um, so that would be our, I would say our, our, our bread and butter or historical uh, customer has been that. Uh, recently, again, with crypto has been picking up. So those we've starting to get more usage there and um, also now tier two, tier three banks as well. So. And, you know, we're now talking, I mean, IOT is another one where they're very interested in large data. So we're having a lot of conversations there, too. Gotcha. So if people are interested in learning a little bit more about 3Forge, you know, where's the best place for them to go online? Uh, well, uh, LinkedIn, 3Forge. Uh, yep, there you go. Look at that. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. And so we do um, we do um, updates very frequently on here and we're doing new stories and new features we have. Um, another thing I haven't really touched on is we have adapters to hundreds of different types of databases. That's part of this leave the data where it is. Um, and so we talk about the different types of databases on here a lot and things like that. And, and when we're integrating with new systems, so we're doing a side by side comparison. It just comes with the territory when we're integrating with so many different types of systems, you know, we're introduced. Um, and so we're always comparing and, and we're putting that sort of information on LinkedIn. So it's a good, yeah, it's a good resource. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, before we wrap up, one of the final questions that I love asking every guest that comes on is when you think about your journey of where you've been and you think about where you are now, you know, what's two pieces of advice that you would share with other entrepreneurs? And it could be you reiterating something you've mentioned earlier, or it can be two new things. Okay. Well, uh, two new things. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do something new here and make it uh, instead of just repeating old stuff. Um, I would say one is, you know, there's this old, there's the old saying, which is you make your luck. Um, so a lot of it was luck. I mean, I, I got, I got lucky being introduced to the right people at the right time with certain problems after certain events, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, I, I, I definitely made my luck. You know, I got, I got things ready. I got everything in place so that when the opportunity hit, I was there at the same time. I, I will concede there was a chance that that the company could have failed. I mean, there was definitely, you know, there were times where if we didn't hit certain key events, it would have been problematic. That was, you know, five years ago, maybe, maybe even longer than that. But, um, you know, definitely, uh, you know, some things are out of your control, but you definitely want to try to control what you can. Um, the second thing of advice I'd have is, uh, you know, and, and I can't give I can't give general I, I, I don't want to give general advice, but I'll say for me in particular, um, I, I always knew I wanted to try to start something and do something different. Um, and so I really focused and worked very hard when I was in industry, when I was actually sitting at these large companies to try to absorb as much information as I can, um, you know, and, and, and try to really um, diversify the different use cases I was getting involved with and, and really try to, because just like in life, I mean, there's a reason you learn an instrument, right? I mean, it's, I, you know, I, I know the piano a little bit, trust me, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm by no means going to be doing concerts. But the point is, if you, if you, if you do, if you dabble in, in as many different diverse things as you can, kind of surrounding the, the space you want to go into, the better off you are. I guess an analogy would be as if you want to open a restaurant and you love French food, well, it still probably makes sense to try different kinds of food that helps you expand your palate. Same thing with, with technology. Awesome. I love it. Well, Robert, thank you so much for being an amazing guest on the show. It was a pleasure having you today. Okay. Thank you, Terrell.
Thank you for tuning in to the Business Talk Library. If you like our content, be sure to follow us on social media. And if you want to see more of our exclusive content, you can subscribe and become a member on patreon.com forward slash business talk library. Hey, the Business Talk Library is the place where business makes sense.